we're going to start right now. And we understand that some people do not wish to be recorded, in which case you may turn off your camera, though we encourage everyone who's comfortable doing so to stay visible um, so we can feel like we're all together. If this is not the session you intended to join, return to spot me and select a different session. Joining me today from JCC Association is Sarah Koffler, Early Childhood Specialist. Um, our names appear as hosts at the top of your participant list. You can chat with us uh, if you have any uh, questions you need addressed during the session. We aspire for every person to feel they belong at ProCon 21 and are working to build inclusive spaces in which all people feel welcome, respected, safe, and fully included. To that end, we encourage you to consider the following suggestions as we begin our time together. We invite you to rename yourself in Zoom with your agency, and if you're comfortable, adding your preferred personal pronouns. We have enabled closed captioning, and you have the option to turn it off using the button on the bottom toolbox. Please reach out to my colleague or me in chat if there's anything we can do to enhance your learning experience. We are thrilled to offer this multifaceted conference at no cost to our JCCs, which was made possible because of our very generous ProCon 2021 sponsors. Each sponsor believes in the JCC movement and the incredible work JCCs accomplish day in and day out. Their representatives are proud to be with us to share their expertise and offerings. We hope you will join us in showing appreciation for their support by visiting their booths in our virtual vendor hall. We also encourage you to connect with them anytime during ProCon 2021 and beyond. During the conference, you can use the chat feature to connect with them. And after the conference, reach out using their contact information as listed. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to turn things over to Debbie Cooper, Director of Engagement, and Tracy Newman, Director of Community Engagement at PJ Library and the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. Thank you so much, Tracy and Sarah, for inviting us to be here today. It is such a pleasure. Um, Tracy, do you just want to sort of wave your hand and smile? Tracy Newman is the Director of Community Engagement, who's joining me today to share the results of the Pulse Survey, the second one that we've done, um, that was fielded between March 21st and March, I'm sorry, February 21st and March 5th. Um, we before we get into that, we started the session which that's with that song, which I just love from the first time I heard it, um, because we think you might need to hear that. Because if you're anything like the parents that we spoke to, um, I think we all need to hear that this year, no matter sort of what our job is personally or professionally. Um, before I talk about the survey itself, I just want to share a very quick background about PJ Library. I see there are some professionals on the call, PJ Library professionals, so we're happy to have you here. Please use the chat uh, to introduce yourselves and share out if you are a PJ professional. And I even see some former PJ professionals in the room too, which is awesome. And we're thrilled that you've um, continued to stay engaged as a Jewish communal professional in another capacity. So it's good to have all of you here. Um, the next slide just gives you a sense of, um, let's see, perfect, PJ Library. Um, you, you know, the thing to take away from us today is we are not just a book program. So if you were acquainted with us many years ago, that might be how you think about us. Um, but we serve um, PJ Library families with children um, now birth through 12 years old. We used to start at six months and a change we made in the last year was actually this people can sign the day that a child is born. Um, we aspire to serve um, any family that considers themselves Jewish, no matter their level of Jewish observance or knowledge. Um, we intend this to be a sort of welcoming and inclusive experience. Uh, families have access to free Jewish books, music, podcasts, resources, and activities, and those um, seem to grow each year. And finally, and this is probably where a lot of you uh, may see yourselves intersect with our work or literally are our work, is we um, through our implementing partners on the ground. We have over 200 in North America. Our professionals host opportunities for families to attend events and programs to go beyond the books and engage in local communities. So if you are sort of engaged in any way with the PJ Library community because you're a PJ professional or you're a part of a JCC that is doing um, either the implementing partner, we have 15 of those, um, or you just sort of participate in PJ because you're connected to the implementing partner in your community. Can you just put a thumbs up uh, in the group so I can see um, sort of like the familiarity level? I'm gonna do my best to now see the gallery at the same time. 
Perfect. All right. I see lots of thumbs up coming. Sasha, great. Rianne, great. Allison, great. Tracy, we, we know Lauren. Love it. Okay, perfect. So um, we have lots of friends in the room with us, which is always, you know, fantastic. Um, if you, um, you know, might think, and it's so funny because sometimes I run into people that think, um, like, oh, I didn't realize PJ Library was a national program. I'm like, no, it's not only national, it's international. They think it's just sort of operating in their backyard. Um, this, we're, you know, we're here to say that we are truly a global program um, operating. We've gifted more than 44 million books since the program's inception about 15 years ago. We operate now in 30 countries across six continents. And we have books now in seven languages, many of those languages just sort of popping up in the last couple of years. Um, so just so you're sort of right on the edge of sort of what's new and current with PJ, our newest programs popped up this past year in Portugal. We have 30 kids enrolled with Portuguese books. In Tokyo, we have 40 kids enrolled and the language there is English books as we're serving mostly the expat community. And Dubai, 30 kids also in English. Um, and another fun fact, we launched recently in Brazil and we have 30 families in the Amazon jungle of Brazil. So it's really cool um, to think about that if your family is a PJ Library family or you know them, that they are literally reading uh, oftentimes the same book in different languages in different countries, truly creating a global um, Jewish experience for families. So now, um, just so we're all sort of operating with the same baseline, I wanna move you into um, what we're here to share today, which is the results of the poll survey. As I mentioned, this is the second one that we did. The first one we fielded back in September, October. And the idea here was to really understand how our families are doing um, given the you know, current climate with the sort of most exceptional year we've all just had. Um, because we, you know, as you, I'm sure know, it was not business as usual, and we really wanted to understand how our families were doing and how we might be able to better support them. Um, the survey itself, we designed it to feel relational. So we didn't ask questions um, saying like, you know, did you go to any programs? How were they for you? What are you likely to go to? Like the questions that we're, we tend to ask after like programs, like evaluations, these questions were about like, how are you? How are you doing? What are you doing? What does work life look like for you? What might you need? How might you want support? You know, questions like that. Um, we'll share today both quantitative and qualitative research. Um, you can see here this survey focused in North America um, with both PJ Library and PJ Arway Kids. PJ Arway is our program for nine to 12 year olds, families with 12 to nine year olds. Today, we're gonna focus on PJ Library only, um, particularly because there is just so much data. Uh, um, and we you know, just sort of fielded the survey, got it back and are analyzing. So I would say we're still in the early stages of looking at the data and what it means, but we have some really interesting findings that we're excited to um, share with you today. Um, we did not, oh, just go back one second, Sarah. I just wanna say a couple other things about this. It's, I, this is like my longest slide. Um, we did not send the families to our entire database of you know, over a hundred some thousand families in North America. We only selected a sample, just being mindful of demands on parents. We wanted to do a sample. Um, and based on looking at the demographics of the family that answered and the way that we weighted the survey, we are confident that the results are representative of the general PJ library. Um, experience and family base. And you can see too that we had families in both the US and Canada. We oversampled in Canada, so we'd be able to talk about Canada separately. Sometimes in this survey, we'll refer to both countries together where the results were not statistically different. But in a few instances, you will see that the US and Canada look um, a little bit differently. And finally, we had a 15% response rate, which is excellent um, and assures us that the data is indeed valid and representative. Awesome, that's all the like upfront stuff, disclaimers that you sort of need to say in advance. Maybe the least interesting piece of this whole thing. Okay, so let's just take a look now at who has, um, who filled out this survey and what it looks like. Who are the families that um, we're talking about here? Um, so the first thing is, um, you know, a little less than a third of families consider themselves interfaith. Um, in the US and that number looked a little bit lower in Canada, but both are representative of our overall PJ Library family community, given what we know in our triennial survey, which is an evaluation that we launch every three years to better understand our community. 13% um, in the US and 10% in Canada. 
um, describe their household as having a person of color in their household. Um, interestingly, this is slightly higher um, than numbers that we've seen in our triennial. And um, you know, the way we can explain that is we were you know, probably under counting potentially, and we have really sort of made distinct efforts to outreach um, to as many families as we can in the last several years. So we're excited to see that number grow. Um, the next three questions are specific to the current time that we're in. You can see that a little more than a third of families have experienced some type of economic insecurity or disruption in some way to their income over the last um, year because of the pandemic. Um, you can see that three quarters are working from home. I see some in the screen, some offices behind you, but mostly some home environments. So a lot of us are still in there and notable that three quarters of parents are in that age. And then the next one is, um, you know, significant between U.S. and Canada. Like there, while the pandemic was in some ways a um, unifying and similar experience for a lot of us um, in many ways, um, schooling looked really different in different countries with 38% um, in the U.S. being in school and 60% of Canadian kids um, in school. So that's a little bit of who we're talking about. Um, I'm going to go into the findings now, and what I want to say is I'd love for this part to be as interactive as we can. I'm going to do my best. I'm like looking to the side because I have another screen here to sort of toggle between the chat as well. So if you have questions, and there are going to be a couple of times when I prompt, I'm going to ask you to use the chat for that, and I'll be following along as well. What's interesting to us and sharing this is going to be what's interesting to you. So please let us know sort of what you want to know more about and we'll do our best to address it in real time. So before I go into how families are doing, I want to do it a moment to say, how are you doing? Um, which is sort of what we started this with. So I'm going to do my best to um, share my screen. Sarah, am I ready to do that? Let me make sure that you are all set. Um... Yep, all set. Beautiful. Okay. Now I just have to make the magic happen on my end. Actually, now that I said that. There are just so many screens. <laughs> <laughs> so many buttons. <laughs> um, yeah, I can share. Perfect. Great. Okay, great. Can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up if you can see me. Okay, perfect. So, you know, the reason I started with this question, because, you know, when I told you we wanted our survey to feel relational, and that's the first question that we asked our families. Um, and um, we asked you the same question. And I think you might see that the answers are pretty um, similar in nature. And the one thing I'll just remind everybody again is this survey happened, you know, in February and March. It was really cold and dark, dark days in many parts of the country during that time. Vaccination efforts were not where they are today. Um, and so just sort of keep that context. But that said, I still think a lot of the um, results would be pretty similar. And this also is like another validation for me. Um, although I'm really happy to see excited and energized and hopeful. And no doubt it's in part for maybe how you spent the last several days with your colleagues at the JCC conference. Okay, Sarah, you can go back to your share and I'm gonna go back into the presentation. So as I said, the first thing we did was ask families, um, how are you doing? And our first finding is they are tired, overwhelmed and grateful, happy, grateful still. And why do I say still? Because the first poll survey that we released and shared with our internal audience of PJ Library professionals had exactly the same words um, and it almost exactly um, the same order. If you go to the next slide, you can see the word bubble um, for how people felt. And um, you know, you can see tired, overwhelmed. Those were words that we saw in yours as well. What's notable here between our two surveys is that the number of people that selected tired increased by nine points in the US and 12 points in Canada. Um, overwhelmed, similar proportion. And then the next one was sort of happy, grateful, you know, coupled together um, in terms of how parents are doing. And, you know, as a working professional, as a parent, I could say like those pretty much resonated with me as well. Um, I think, um, and so we're gonna dig a little bit more into sort of what that means. Um, the next question we asked people um, to shed some light on that is, you know, what are your biggest concerns at this time? You know, what might be driving, uh, you know, we didn't ask them this, but for us, it was like, what was driving some of those adjectives and words? Um, and overwhelmingly, 
um, mental health and well-being of families and health and safety due to COVID were the first two um, concerns that people selected. We gave them, you know, a huge list of, not huge list, but a, a fulsome list of things they could choose from. And you can see that about half of families um, chose those. Um, you know, what's notable was in our first poll survey, mental health and well-being of my family was not actually an answer that we gave, and it came up so frequently. Um, we had similar ones, but not specifically calling out mental health um, and well-being, and it came up so frequently um, in the opened end comments that we put it um, as an answer choice, and sure enough, it became, you know, the most popular one. And, you know, when we ask ourselves, what is meant by mental health and well-being? What are people talking about? We had an open-end question as well for people to, um, you know, expand on their answers. Like you, you know, we sort of pre-populated it and said, you said that mental health and well-being was a concern. Can you tell us a little bit more what you mean by that? So the next slide we dug into is mental health and you can see, um, you know, what it meant. Um, it both, we heard comments in regards to both parents and kids, parents' mental health and kids' mental health. The sense of isolation um, was really, you know, continuing to weigh on people. And remember, this was February and March, where in many parts of the country, it was really hard to get outside and do things. Um, there were a number of notable mentions of mental illness, depression, anxiety um, came up um, frequently, um, naming it with a lot of, um, you know, comments about either you know, this was exacerbated by the pandemic, or I'm starting to see signs of this in myself or my children, and I'm worried about it. Um, anxiety and stress were also common words that we saw often. Um, I had, when I presented this for the first time last week at our um, PJ Library Conference, I had just read an article in the New York Times um, that was talking about family vacations and how people might attempt to do this. Um, and I think you can apply what they said about vacations to anything, is they say, it isn't just about con attempting connection, relaxation, and joy. It's about constantly negotiating and mitigating danger. And I think that really sort of plays into the sense of like this decision fatigue that our families are feeling about, um, worried about sort of socialization of their kids and development of their kids and wanting to combat the isolation that they're feeling, but they're always doing it within the context of balancing the health and safety of their family. Um, and as we all know, like that is just exhausting. Um, so uh, while a lot of the comments were focused on in this survey in particular, sort of more, I would say more insular, but sort of more um, close to families, like what's happening within families. Um, this was a little bit of a difference in the last survey that they, we did, which predated the election, where you saw politics um, and sort of stress in the world as sort of, you know, higher on people's concern list that seemed uh, politics concerned, went, concerned about politics um, went way down. But there still were a lot of people who were talking about broader social issues, racial injustice, being really significant stressors. And the next quote is just, I pulled one quote from a family that seemed to um, really sort of, um, um, you know, sort of share that. Sarah, next slide is great. Um, I worry my children are being left to their own devices too much. I'm not equipped to educate, socialize, and care for them all on my own while also working a full-time job. At the same time, there are broader social issues flourishing everywhere of which racial injustice is one. The pandemic exposed so many cracks, but none were ever fixed. And there were a number of comments like that that sort of focused not just on sort of what was happening in the family and that being stressful, but also operating within a context of stress and anxiety as well, which I think really contributes to a sense of lack of control, which as many of us know, can really sort of um, exacerbate feelings of anxiety and depression in families. To get another sense of how families were doing, we asked them a number of agreement statements um, you know, to fluctuate. I miss connecting in person with friends, 90 to 95% of families. I think we all can relate to that. Um, so, you know, almost more than three, you know, almost three quarters in the US and more in Canada, um, miss visiting their grandparents in person. There were a lot of comments about sort of worrying about the fraying connections between grandchildren and grandparents. And in some homes, um, the idea of grandparents being the holder of Jewish life and Jewish traditions in the family. And that came up a lot around um, Passover. And finally, this sense, um, which, you know, again, I think parents might always feel, but this question was, I found it harder to balance my various responsibilities. 
Um, and no doubt with three quarters of people working from home and trying to do everything, um, you know, the vast majority of our families felt this as well. So that sort of is like our first sort of, you know, big finding in general, like how are families doing? And in our communities, we talked about, you know, what, what does this mean? So the questions that we started to raise were, what do we need to do to best support the families in our communities right now? And how might these findings influence both our offerings and our communications with families? So are what we do are what we are offering to families meeting their needs and where they are, or do we need to shift, you know, again, like we've all been shifting this entire time and the now famous word pivoting to serve families, you know, what do we need to do in this moment? Um, as we're in this stage. And so if anyone in the group you know, has thoughts about what this data made them think about or anything surprising, I'll just sort of pause now for any questions as we move into the next couple of set of findings. We have four today that we'll share out. Sorry, it's my home phone, it never rings. No, it does. Okay. So I'm going to keep an eye on the chat, but I sort of keep moving along. Yeah, so Fran said it's affirming. Yeah, I mean, like that's this whole thing about this pandemic. It's like we are also living it. So, um, you know, I think we see that in, um, you know, in what we're in our own lives as well. So the next part is we looked at, um, you know, to what extent families' Jewish identity is um, impacting how they are experiencing the pandemic and whether it's something that they're drawing on or not, um, you know, during this time. We found that two thirds of families, nearly two thirds said that connecting to their Jewish identity felt especially important to them at this time. And if we go to the next slide, you can see um, we dug a little bit deeper into what that meant. And what's interesting is that 60% is this exactly the same um, percentage as we found in our um, last study, Pulse One. And one table asked a very similar question um, um, about young adults, and they also came up with 60% as well. So it's a pretty um, good indicator uh, that we feel pretty confident about this number. So of those families who said, you know, if it felt important to connect, in what way, like what, what activities were important to you of your Jewish identity? And overwhelmingly, and not surprisingly, celebrating Jewish holidays, you know, came up. And we distinct uh, separated that from Shabbat in particular, but Jewish holidays was really important to them. Um, it was also really interesting that consuming Jewish media and books was important to them during this time. Um, you know, given that we are a program that sends Jewish books to families, it might just be a function of like, that's who we are asking the question, but we didn't say consuming reading PJ library books like we sometimes do. So that's something that we're curious about and sort of wanna know a little bit more about. Um, talking about Jewish values as they relate to current events. Um, there were a lot of comments about sort of using our books and um, values and media to um, talk about to kids what's happening in the world as it relates to current um, climate and celebrating Shabbat. And we'll get into that a little bit more as well. Uh, but that gives us a sense. And the next slide is just a visual representation of when we asked families to sort of explain what they meant in terms of their Jewish identity, what that looked like with Shabbat sort of, you know, the, the size of the word here has to do with the frequency of how many times it was mentioned. Um, and that was a really interesting finding for us as well. So if you see Shabbat and holidays and celebrate as the sort of, you know, sort of biggest words here, along with family, we asked an open-ended question about how were these elements helpful for you during this time? Um, and there were really beautiful testimonials from families about, um, you know, specifically what about Shabbat, what about holidays? Um, in um, a family in Texas said, being regular observers of the holidays helps it helps to anchor our lives and connect our families. Every Shabbat, there is something so comforting in lighting candles together, even in these unprecedented times. Oh, you can go back. Sorry, Sarah. I was just sort of like putting a couple quotes. Um, and um, you, there was a number of comments about the sort of visceral experience of lighting candles and sort of light and darkness um, that families are responding to. We had a number of quotes around. It gave them a small sense of control. Um, one woman in Quebec said, blessing our children every Shabbat gives me a small sense of control over our family's well-being while reminding me to be thankful that we still do have each other and our health. And that also speaks to maybe that adjective of grateful that came up pretty frequently. And with the holiday, um, what we really saw there was it punctuated 
a sort of um, dark time for families and gave them something to look forward to. It was an opportunity to be together with family. A lot of them did it virtually with families and it provided a sort of burst of joy during an unstressful, uh, during a stressful time. And yes, where Sarah was going with the next page of quotes, um, you know, again, just sort of illustrates um, some of the themes that we saw. These have been bright spots in a dark calendar. One of the things that PJ Library that we got really excited about was that um, there was a sense of empowerment um, families for families who had only done this in other spaces or had sort of been participants, they were now having to do for themselves. And so they were sort of taking ownership and learning and doing these rituals on their own. And then there were some families that sort of stepping back from um, this sort of, you know, hoopla that might sort of come with holidays um, with a lot of people or sort of, you know, feeling like they're running around. Um, there were some families who said, you know, we really like this sort of more intimate experience of, you know, doing holidays on our own and sort of having more time um, to do that as well. So that's sort of, you know, our second finding is that people were overwhelmingly, you know, at least two thirds of families draw, or about two thirds of families drawing on their Jewish heritage to help them during this time, which was really exciting. In terms of what we're thinking about now as we move forward is, you know, how do we continue to support families to do Jewish in ways that are meaningful to them? Um, we got the sense, and we'll see in the next part, that a lot of families, like this was newer to them and they tried new things during this time. And so how do we do that? And how do we help build on the sense of independence and confidence with Jewish ritual that some families have gained over this time? So if families' experience was, you know, I'm, I go somewhere to be Jewish, I go to my preschool, I go to a synagogue, um, this was a time when like they saw that they could do Jewish for themselves as a supplement and they still value and will see miss those community connections, but really felt a sense of pride and ownership in the home. So curious like how this resonates either with your own experiences or, um, you know, sort of what you're seeing in your work. Um, but that was sort of an exciting finding for us here. And I'll pause just for a moment. We get caught up. Yeah, questions about planning from the fall, you know, fall for sure, I think. And we're going to actually get to some forward looking questions as well about sort of how pa what parents are thinking about for the future. So, you know, let's hold that thought. Um, you know, as we move on to sort of continue to dig into um, some of the Jewish um, behaviors and traditions at home, I just want to highlight on the next slide um, some of the new traditions that happened during this time that families did. We saw um, next slide, that 36% um, of families, so more than a third of families, established a new or made more regular Shabbat ritual during this time, which feels very exciting, and they were excited to talk about it in great detail and what it meant to their family. Um, about a quarter started a challah baking routine during this time, and we specifically included the root word routine in there, not like I baked challah once, but um, you know, we sort of began a routine together and a quarter of families attended services or a program with a Jewish organization that was new to them during this time. And so those were like new Jewish behaviors that we were curious about. And I'll mention that the Shabbat one in particular, we saw that number increase by five points um, from our last poll survey to now. And I think it's interesting to um, note that like there's tension here between sort of what we saw earlier of families feeling like tired and exhausted, but also taking on new and different things that require some you know work to do, Shabbat, um, challah baking. So there's obviously some benefits here that families are seeing that help to sort of balance, like get them through that exhaustion and tired feeling to do this. Um, and we can go through the next slides, which will you know probe us and to help us some understanding why? So we had seen some of these findings during our first survey and our questions were like, okay, why? Like what made them start to, you know, establish these new behaviors, both to help understand now, but also into the future. So, and each of these are, the behaviors had different drivers. For Shabbat, um, you know, the number one driver was finding comfort in Jewish traditions and practices. Um, and we saw that echoed a lot in the comments as well. Some that I read about Shabbat was that it just felt like something to help ground them in the week. It was for, you know, became familiar. It became traditional, the lighting of the candles. Um, 
made them sort of want to seek this out. And another factor was that we have more time at home. And so I think it's this idea of maybe parents who might have, you know, be commuting, um, have more time to prepare, or maybe it's the idea of they can sort of do it in between meetings because they're um, home. Um, and maybe it was a way to sort of punctuate sort of what always just sort of felt like home and needing to do some differentiation. And we saw some of those questions as well. So that was something that we're seeing and thinking about as we think about how to help families, how to support families in this practice, both who found Shabbat during this time to be a comforting ritual and those who might not have yet and how can we help. Um, the next slide we talk specifically about challah baking and sort of what happened there. Um, and in this case, it was the increased time at home that was sort of the lead um, factor that led parents and, you know, as a, you know, somebody who used to work outside of the home, like, yeah, having time to sort of do that challah in the morning and check it and move it from bowl to the oven um, during the day, like that really helped me. So as we think about, you know, what are things that parents might want to be doing and are finding valuable, but, um, you know, time, you know, becomes an issue. Are there shortcuts and ways that we can help people do what they want to be doing and things they want to find valuable? And what was really interesting about this one, which didn't appear in the other ones, um, was that they were inspired by social media. I don't know if anyone here in this group is part of the Modern Jewish Baker Facebook group that sort of emerged during this time. Uh, but even if you're not, there were a lot of challah bakes going on and people posting pictures of different challahs and things that they tried. We also saw that in a general world, there was a lot of sourdough baking and starters. And yeah, Modern Jewish Baker is awesome. Um, there were a lot of, you know, just general baking overall as a sense of comfort and self-sufficiency and wanting to like nurture your family um, and feed others um, that sort of happened during this time. So again, like what can we learn from this and what might we start to do to sort of build um, on it? Um, and then the third, and I love, I saw that the Milwaukee JCC gave a Shabbat box uh, for camp families. I think that's amazing. And that's something that we saw um, with many of our professionals in JCCs and federations and other organizations is like that ritual of like, we're, we're going to help make it easier for you to do things through providing you ritual items and tools, or maybe it's an inspiration or a reminder. And I think those things are all great and exactly moving in the right direction. And then um, for those who attended sort of a new organization or a new Jewish experience, like, you know, what motivated you? And again, we see finding comfort. But what was super interesting to us is that, like, I was invited by a friend or family member to do this. Um, more than half of half of families said that. And that's something that, again, just continues to remind us, like, as we think about, you know, getting people into the doors, into our programs, into camps, into schools, um, it is that personal touch that is a motivating factor for so, so much um, that we do. So how do we take the people who love us and turn them into raving fans that they're telling everybody um, just how you know amazing their experiences are and want to bring their friends? How are we reminding people to do it? How are we incentivizing people to do it? Um, it's just a good reminder, the power of the personal um, touch. And in our work, um, in our communities, um, we have about 40 communities that have parent connectors that are parents um, who are employed by their or, uh, PJ Library organizations in their communities to be on the ground working relationally, meeting people one on one and inviting them to things and creating their own experiences for families. And so, you know, to the extent that there are connectors or connector like people in your communities or networks, those are great way either formally paid or informally activated. Those are great ways to sort of um, formalize some of that relational work and structure. Okay, I'm going to stop here and move us um, to our next and um, right implications for our work. Um, I sort of talked about throughout, but how do we continue to reinforce this? And somebody um, wrote in the chat the democratization of doing Jewish, which I absolutely love. Um, I think that's right. And how do we continue to support it? So we're not just the providers of holders of experiences, but we actually are activating families to do Jewish on their own. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move us to the final um, finding that we um, are focusing on for this presentation. And this is a look forward as people think about returning to um, I don't want to say pre-COVID life, like what that looks like, because there is no sort of going back, but what a new normal might look like, like what are we hearing from parents? Um, so, you know, overall, um, they are eager to be in touch and connect with other people, which we'll talk about in the slides, but they're also very concerned, particularly as kids remain unvaccinated at this point. 
So before we even get into the safety stuff, the first thing uh, I want to share, the first finding I want to share is um, what did people do during um, the pandemic that was different than they did before in terms of family time? And what might those what um, what activities might continue or into the future? So, you know, you can see on the left hand side of the screen that connecting virtually with family, cooking and baking together, watching TVs and movies, outdoor activities, and playing games, creative projects are all things that people did more. Um, we saw a lot of that on social media, so this probably isn't that surprising to you. You probably have done many of these things. And so that's just looking at sort of, you know, what people were doing that they did, you know, really, um, you know, help them get through this time. And then we asked them, um, you know, what um, might you continue to do as we move forward? And um, cooking and baking together and outdoor activities and exercise were sort of the top two, although they're all kind of in the same range. But, you know, I think it's great and like certainly significant for this group here, um, you know, outdoor activities and exercise, like that's something that people did during the pandemic because it was either safer or different or, um, you know, things that they could do together. And they're like 44% of them said like, yeah, I wanna keep doing more of that. So that's interesting to know. And cooking and baking together also, you know, a great way to sort of um, uh, immerse Jewish ritual and tradition there. Um, but really, you know, sort of all of these activities are worth um, noting. And as we go into sort of thinking about the offerings that we provide families and what might they be looking for, um, what we really saw is um, there is a, not surprisingly, very significant concern that there is no, or, or I guess not no, but there's limited guidance, although we continue to you know, hear more each day about you know, how to move forward, even as parents are vaccinated in a world in which their kids are unvaccinated and what that looks like and um, you know, how to navigate that. Uh, there's again going back to that decision fatigue there's a lot of gray area about why we can go to this space but not this space why we might be able to hang with this family but not that family and that's something that feels really stressful to parents as they think about it there are a lot of trust issues about like how you know as i'm out more in the world and not just quarantining in my house how can i and how can i trust that um, other people are being safe and what we heard time and time again, which is certainly impactful for our work as organizations that provide programs, is it is very important to parents that there is clear um, protocols and safety um, guidelines in place and communicated clearly when promoting events and that when those events um, are happening, that they are enforced. So want to see sort of when they sign up for something, are people going to be masked? Is it going to be distance? How is it going to be, um, you know, sort of enforced um, there? And then when they get there, they want to know that sort of it's not going to be on them to enforce those guidelines if they were communicated. So, you know, this is sort of not to tell you what we think should happen or what those protocols should be. Hopefully we'll continue to get guidance from the government um, on that. This is um, just being really upfront and transparent uh, about those guidelines, whatever you decide to families. Um, the next thing that we saw and heard from people is um, both a desire for hybrid and outdoor, outdoor programming. So the first thing was people do, you know, like many of us feel that outdoor programming is safer. And if they're going to engage in community events, they wanna do it outside. Luckily, this is coming at a time when it might be um, you know, okay for us to be heading outdoors. And so I think outdoor programming is going to be where it's at this summer in terms of family events, and that's where families were comfortable. And we also heard that there was such increased accessibility to programs at home um, in their things that people are worried that those are going to go away. So, um, you know, a lot of us, for those of us, you know, in this space, a lot to think about, about how we sort of bring people back in person, but also try to continue to think about what were the things that really worked well virtually that we might wanna keep. Um, all within the same constraints and budget resources, of course. And finally, um, looking ahead, families want help connecting to other families. They are, um, a lot of them feel out of practice um, and not having socialized for quite a long time and what that feels like. And in particular, we heard that a lot from new parents 
Um, you know, I expected to meet a lot of people during this time and I didn't. And so what does it look like to connect people? And I'm really looking for organizations to help do that. And so it wasn't so much about like, I'm looking for an exciting program to get me out of my house. It was, I wanna go into a space where they're gonna help me find my people. Um, and so as we think about um, sort of the roles that we play in communities, you know, to know that's really a need of families right now. So I'm gonna pause here. This is sort of where we landed. I'm gonna sort of look for any comments in the chat, but turn it to Tracy to help sort of bring this work, you know, really to you and the work that you're doing in your organizations and communities. Hi, everyone. Um, so that was a whole lot of information. Um, and as some of it, as Debbie said, um, we're living this life as well. Uh, many of us are parents or grandparents. We're seeing it with our friends and ourselves and our kids and, and our families. Um, and so, you know, kind of putting on all of those hats and your professional um, hat, regardless of whether you're in early childhood or camp or sports and wellness or whatever department um, you're coming, you're zooming in from. Um, we'd love to know what you're thinking and how this impacts you. I think someone mentioned planning for the fall. Um, some of us can't think past tomorrow. So, you know, we would really challenge you to, you know, it's okay to think about through summer, through the three months, through in three month increments, because the world is still constantly changing and evolving um, around us. So I just put in the chat um, to, uh, two prompts um, and Sarah is going to magically put us into breakout groups um, that we can spend just a few minutes um, on our own um, for about five minutes or so uh, to kind of distill some of this information and what's resonating with you, what may be something you wrote down, uh, and then we'll uh, gather back um, to pull it all together. So Sarah, take us somewhere okay. magical. Here we go. Um, and the rooms are open. So. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so fun to chat with people in a smaller group. Um, if you have anything that you want to share um, from your group, some idea, some insight, some thing that you wrote down on your to-do list, um, just throw it in the chat. We'd love to see what people are taking away from our session and what questions still may remain, because we know you have great lay leadership um, and um, partners to work with on the ground. So I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Kaplowitz now. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Tracy. Um, it's great to see all of you here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my impressions from the study um, as it relates to the work that we're doing with military families. Um, just to give you some numbers, like there's about 42,000 um, children, parents, um, who are Jewish in um, the US military. And we received a grant from PJ Library, an engagement grant to really figure out how do we work with these families? We've piloted some really great ideas. And um, as I'm learning this data that was collected, I'm recognizing that there's a lot of similarities between the experience of families now during COVID and what military families are experiencing all the time. And I'll just give you some of those ideas, you know, um, separation from family, military families experience that, um, financial stress, um, having to be all the roles to children um, when spouses are deployed, um, the lack of rootedness to a location, which people all of a sudden experienced during COVID that it didn't make a difference where you were living if you were stuck at home. Um, and so what we're learning now, all of us, is how to support families during this time and through this grant, we are learning how to support military families at all times with this. And um, so one of the questions this is just leaving me with, and I wanna leave it with you as well, is which of our families does this data resonate with and will continue to resonate with them and tell the part of their story even after COVID is over? Um, are there families for whom once we open the doors wide um, that, their experience won't be something that they will necessarily be able to take back with us into our community. And have we learned something about our practice to enable us to connect with those families over the long run? So um, I wanna leave that question with you. And um, I hope that you'll be able to communicate with me, share some of your findings. Um, and uh, Sarah will let you know some opportunities to do that. Thank, 
Thank you, Tracy. And thank you so much to Debbie and Tracy for sharing your wisdom with us today. It is so inspiring to hear about the important work PJ Library is doing. And we are so grateful to have you as our partners. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. As we continue to grow and strengthen this field for engaging families professionals, this session is truly just the beginning, and we are so excited to continue to dive into this work in meaningful ways. We are dreaming big here at JCC Association, and we want you to be our partner. We hope you can join our Engaging Families working team on Tuesday, May 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern to continue the conversation. There will be more information to follow in the coming weeks, but please let us know if you're interested and available to attend. I'll put my email address in the chat box, or alternatively, if you put your email address in the chat box, we'll be happy to reach out as soon as we have more details to share. And even in our last day of this amazing conference, there are still so many exciting ProCon experiences for us to share together. So here's a few quick announcements regarding the rest of our day. A quick reminder that the virtual vendor hall will be open again today from 1.45 to 2.45 Eastern. During this time, sponsors will be available for live, engaging, and informative video breakouts. You'll see product demos and have an opportunity to ask questions about how vendors' products and services can best help your JCC. If you have a trusted advising session, you can use the link that was sent to you to meet with your advisor. And finally, be sure to join us at 3 p.m. Eastern to close out your 2021 ProCon experience amidst thousands of your peers at the final JCC Movement Moment Power and Community. We'll be joined by experienced JCC professionals and professionals from beyond the movement to engage in a roundtable discussion on the imperative of cross-community collaboration that comprises the linking of arms, hearts, and minds. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and we can't wait to see you again soon. Take care, be well, and thank you.